This is just a little bit of a uh, thing I started messing around with tonight. And since we're going to be doing titles or credit sequences for movies, it's good to look at some of the uh, possibilities you have for pushing just simple things like this letter A. Uh, I put a grayscale image on top of it and I used that grayscale as displacement for the glass and I threw a cross blur on it and you know I got something that you would see in a theater pretty quickly. Hey Alex with very little work and basically it's the grayscale image that's driving everything. And the beauty of this is this is procedural, meaning something is driving it. So if I change this, and then I change the size of the grayscale that I've got, I'll show you what I mean by that. So let me shrink this down a little bit. So there's some fall off. Okay, I'm gonna hide that again. And now you see everything I'd already done still works because of that grayscale shape I made that drives this whole animation. There's a grayscale shape layer that's driving this whole thing and I colorized it with an adjustment layer. Um, so glass, the shape plus the effects of mask is what's causing the distortion and I colorized the light in the glass there and then the cross blur I just set that to be both radial and uh, X and Y and my keyframes are all right here it's it's you know you can see here's my X and my Y I'm going from a high number to zero for both of those and I just keyframe the displacement and the position of the light with the light height I could even, if I wanted to, at this point, change the light position since I made a full word. But before I do that, I'm going to center that. And now we can worry about that light position. Right here. Okay, so if I start the light position there, I can say, let's move it to the side. Let's see what happens needs to be more than that to do anything. So like that. Light and focus, like blur, are great ways to get some uh, cinematic push to your text. Hello there, Carrie. Hello, Victor. I am so glad that a lot of you are thinking ahead on this assignment. Remember, it's going to be either a movie title or a credit sequence and no pre-existing properties like you can't do a Star Wars or a Marvel superhero thing yeah come up with your own thing now someone's like I've got an idea but too much of the imagery is like rights protected and copyright that's really good you want to try and avoid that if at all possible uh, because things like that you'll get blocked online and it'll be harder to distribute your work so you know, even drawing some of your own, if you want, would help. So I, I encourage you to use as much royalty-free and rights-free images as possible to get this assignment done. But uh, like I was saying, you know, just simple things like blurs and focus and some camera movement really make text pop with uh, 3D stuff and uh, movie work. Also, layering things, like using parallax, you're really going to push this. Like, if I had some particles floating in the background, then even further back than that, a texture, this would really pop. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is just something I threw together really fast, but I just wanted to show you that concept of, you know, blurs and light and fall off of focus to help push things. So it's not just throwing down a font. It's about creating a mood and being consistent with that mood if you're doing something with horror you know use a horror palette use horror themed fonts and images if you're doing a romantic comedy type thing brighter more colorful more saturated make it consistent with the world that you're going to be creating 
So if anyone has any questions, I think it was Alexis. She had a storyboard and I'm actually, while we're on the topic of light, I'm going to dive into part of her storyboard. She was talking about like a light swinging. And this is something I want everyone to get used to is if you've got shapes, hold on to those shapes, use those shapes, parent things to them. So things work together in the world you're building. I'm going to get a little experimental here because that's what it's all about. I just want to push this idea, see if it works. And if it does, you've got a starting point. Okay, so I have two Bezier curve points here to make this shape, all right? And I'm going to drag one of them a little bit off the screen. But you can see they both have a curve handle. Now, I showed you when some people were talking about character rigging. If you select the path right here, and it's got to be something you drew with the pen, it will not work with the geometric shape. So draw it with your pen tool, select the path, then if you go window, create nulls from paths. You got three settings, trace path to draw on and follow it around. That's not what I want. I want the points to follow the nulls. And I'll explain what that means. It means this null, if I move it, it's going to move that point. So this one's the bottom. And this one's the top null. So the idea was a swinging light bulb, okay? And you go, well, why did you do this? And I'll, I'll show you why. I've got these nulls now. And that means I can parent what I want to the null. You want to do as much parenting as possible and using nulls to move things around because you don't want to have a million keyframes. You're slowing yourself down that way. The best professional workflow is to parent things to one object and have that drive a lot of your motion. So we'll pretend I've got nothing selected. We'll pretend that this is the lamp shade and I'll make this a different color just so we can see what's going on okay I'll call this shade I'm going to parent this shade to the bottom null so now when I move my bottom null the path will move and the shade will move as well I'll show you what I mean see like that okay if this were a straight line you'd have it as if it were on a cord i mean on a pole but now you can make it look like it's swinging from a rope all right and we still have this we'll call this the pull string or you know the cord so that means if i want this to look more like a cord i could throw some effects on it if i wanted I know there's a thread one. Let's see what that looks like. And just futzing around, that already looks pretty rope-like. You know what I mean? So it's, it's just about diving in and trying to find what works and you'll notice when I move this around you get a nice effect of that so I'm going to move all of this up so we can make room for our light that's being cast okay so with this going on I've only got a keyframe animate this bottom null and I can go back and forth like a overlapping motion here so that the light is swinging back and forth and I want you to see something here so we've got this moving back and forth hooray now if I rotate this null that's not going to do anything to the path points but watch this since I parented the shade to it now you see this swinging if I choose to so I can find my keyframes, hit Shift and R. So when it goes here, since it's going this direction, I can rotate it up a little bit and I can even move this keyframe a little bit past that 
because it'll give some overlapping action that the rotation goes a little, let's try a few frames past it, goes a little bit past there. Then when it gets to here, I'm gonna have it go in the opposite direction and push that a few frames past there and do that again. And as it swings less and less, I can have it rotate less and less because there's less velocity driving it. So now let's take a look at that. Let's drop down our resolution so it previews faster. See? And that was very little work. And obviously, you want to easy ease your keyframes. If you want to dive into the speed graph with all of that, that's fine. Okay, so let's push this even further. If this null's rotating and the shade is parented to that null, if I make a beam of light and parent that to the shade, that beam of light should rotate while the lampshade's rotating based off that. So let's try that out. I'm gonna go past the edges of the board, I mean the screen, and I'll make this yellow just so it stands out so we can see what's going on. And I'm gonna put this below the shade and I'll parent this to the shade. Now let's see what happens. Yep, look at that. Boom. Okay, it's all about thinking it through. But this is only the beginning of it. I'm gonna call this beam, because it's a light beam. So we've got this going on, right? And if you want a hard edge, fine. But there's a few ways of softening that up. Let's throw rough edges on here, onto the beam. And if we do edge sharpness and go negative, or like go down to zero, I mean. I'm gonna turn this off so I can see what's going on. Let's crank up that border. Now look what's happening. Now we've got a soft edge and we've got something that we can work with. And now that there's a little bit of distressing that's going on as the light bulb moves, if that's what you want. Okay, so we're doing pretty good here. And also we could, let's try radial fill here just for the fun of I'm experimenting like I said and now we'll move it here where the light should be and now we're getting a fall off plus the soft edge okay hooray that's fun stuff now to kick it up a notch from there okay because we've got this idea and it's starting to work So our keyframing ends right about here. And I'm gonna put this file up for everyone to take a look at, but uh, I'm gonna import an image. All right, so I'll bring that in by going file, import file. And we'll put this at the bottom here. And what we'll do is I'll put this below the beam and let's try a luma mat to reveal the image. Now look at that. We've got the soft feathered edge plus the gradation from the light. And now you've created positive and negative space. Pretty easily. Does this make sense to everybody? Like, I know I went through it a little quick, but this is all stuff we've covered. Parenting things together, gray values being a luma mat instead of an alpha mat. And this renders pretty quickly. And as I said before, the more you layer this, like having a crime board or someone standing here, that's gonna add depth to your scene. I'm glad you're following along, Carrie. All right, cool. And like I said, I'm recording this and I'm gonna put this file up for everybody. Uh, I'll just email it out so that you can take a look at it. And like I said, I drew it with crude shapes. Thank you very much, Alexis. I'm always gonna use the simplest 
fastest shapes to teach you these techniques rather than have you watch me draw it out nice and pretty. I'm here to teach you the techniques and then you could apply these techniques to photos or videos or any images you want. That's the important thing. You get as much time to see some of these and ask questions. Because, like I said, the uh, knolls, the knoll is driving everything. The knoll is moving the path. The shade is parented to the knoll. I could use that knoll not only for the position, but also for the rotation as well. And that's what gave me some of that follow through and overlapping motion as I'm overshooting back and forth. Then I just put that gradient fill on the light beam. The beam is parented to the lampshade. It's if you keep a simple workflow and you think your idea through, you can achieve it pretty quickly and then spend the time fine tuning it and making it look pretty. Focus on your motion, then dial in the look. Because I could always swap out these images or whatever I need. Everyone is everyone familiar or comfortable with layering things in 3D space like we did with Parallax a few weeks ago. And if you're not, I could refresh your memory on it. And then once you see it, you'll be like, oh, I get it. And I also want you to think about your blending modes. Because see how now we've got everything still working, plus the blending mode of the type with the image. From what we did earlier. And Alex, I'll tie into your question with this. I'll do parallax and then multiple cameras. Okay, here we go. Each one of these shapes is on its own layer, okay? So let's go back to the swinging light. Picture this as the middle image, like this blue. And then this red could be the person standing in front of it. This could be the crime board, and this could be like dust particles and texture behind that. Okay, so this is a 2D image. To make that sing, you go 2.5D or 3D. So these are my modes. If I click toggle switches and modes, these are my switches. Any layer you want to 2D, 2.5D or 3D enable, you click the cube for it in the little grid for it. So each one of these is now 3D enabled, which means if I hit the P key when I select them, X side to side, Y up and down, Z forward or backward, closer to the camera. So I'm gonna move this one closer to the camera and you see going negative brings it closer to the camera or what the implied camera is. We can add a camera by going layer, new, camera. Uh, I'll do 35 millimeter, hit okay. Okay, so we've got our camera in the scene. This one's negative 1200. Let's try negative six. Actually, yeah, negative 600. This will be zero. And then this one will be positive 600. Yeah, yeah. It's spreading everything out in Z space. So when the camera, we've got our camera tools, the unified camera will swing around like you got it on your shoulder. Let me hit undo. If I hit the C key again, this is the orbit camera. If I hold down shift, I can constrain it to the X. Or if I hold down shift, I can constrain it to the Y. I'm gonna hit C again. This is my pan side to side if I hold down shift. Or if I hold down shift and go up and down, that's my tilt up and down, okay? Then I hit C one more time, and this is my zoom in or zoom out by clicking and dragging. So I'll go to my unified, and now you can see that, oops, let me undo. I've got a touch screen uh, for my laptop here. So now if I zoom in here with my zoom tool, the relation of all the shapes changes. The shapes aren't moving, but the camera moving through them gives you that sense of distortion between the shapes and the spaces that they make. That's what parallax is. So this will be 
beyond helpful with your credit sequences. Like I said, if this yellow one in the far back is like a great big texture and like the blue could be like particles or whatever, and then the green could be the type and then the red could be something over top of that, just layering it as much as possible, spreading it out in Z space, and you're going to get something really nice. It's used left and right with credit sequences and title sequences and a lot of motion design in general, but parallax is a fast way of building some depth to your scene. And while we're talking and I'm just hearing myself talk, I'm going to remind you that not only is this natural fall off and the spread out in Z space important, but also depth of field. So let's try and find, okay, yep, here we go. Now we're cooking with gas. So you'll see everything's getting blurrier the further back it goes. All right, so now as our camera moves through the scene with the zoom, we're gonna have things come in and out of focus as well, okay? I didn't even have to animate the focus. I just picked a focal distance in pixels and I said depth of field on. Now, if you want a prettier one, and you can hop down to a bigger iris shape, but it's going to slow your render time down. So if you don't have a strong computer, don't worry about that. Other things you can do is mess around with the camera settings here. It's not really doing anything we can see. But uh, yes, yeah, so that's two things to consider spreading things out in Z-Space, putting in a camera, and also adding lights. Like layer new, light, we'll do a spotlight, just so it fills up a little bit. And when you got a spotlight, you can move the point of interest, or you can pick the arrows and move it on one axis at a time. And you'll see that axis change. See, it's a Z next to my arrowhead. So that's another way of adding some depth. And then automatically adjust the depth of field when you're zooming in and out. Yes, what happened, Alex, is I set with my camera, I'll go back here. Depth of field is on, that's under camera options, okay? Then I set the focus distance and I didn't change it. So that's the distance the camera's always going to be a focus. Since the camera's moving back and forth in Z-Space when I was doing that, it's still going to keep the same focal length of the distance. It's just as the camera gets closer to things, they'll either fall in or out of focus. And then you can change how much of a blur if you want to push that even harder, like past 100%. That's all up to you. So we added the light, and then you could mess around with your material options. Right down here, we could have them transmit light or cast shadows is always fun because that's going to add some shadows in between your pieces as you have the, uh, see like right there, we got a little bit of shading based upon that. And then if you want to brighten up the whole thing, you could just add, I want layer new light, we'll do an ambient light and the ambient light will lighten up the entire scene. And adjusting the strength of the ambient light, you can dial it down to whatever taste you want. And I know positive 600 was this, the last one. So if I make this 1200, now they're all evenly spaced out. They don't have to be evenly spaced out. It's your choice of what you want to do. So now, we've got all this going on, we've got the shadows, and, you know, like I said, texturing. If you put texture in here and use an alpha mat, that would really look good. Okay, so let's pick a texture. We'll pick, um, this one's nice and bold. So let's find out which shape is which. Okay, this is the front shape. 
So I can move this texture now. Let's see. To line it up more with that. And also scale it up a little bit so it's bigger than the shape that I need. So the shape's above. Remember, I'm going to go to my switches. And I've got the shape I want above, so I'm just going to use that as an alpha mat. So now I've got texture, which automatically makes that shape more interesting. These are just things to think about when you're creating your scenes. And I can put this below the next one. Same thing, make sure it lines up. Position it as I need to. And just set the alpha mat for it. make sure the shape layer or whatever you're using is on top and you know you can move the texture around inside that once you've got it positioned to get it looking the way you want and I'm gonna make sure all those images I just put in are 3d enabled as well because then they're going to blur and catch the light as that's moving now that they're 3d enabled and i just got to make sure that the textures line up again once they're 3d enabled and i told you this before when i don't know what i'm doing i just get all the stopwatches and i click them on for the camera but i know for a fact that the zoom is going to be the one i'm changing so if i go forward a few frames and then i grab my camera zoom tool I zoom in and I say hmm I'm not where I want to be so now I'm going to use my pan tool hold down shift move down a little bit and then I'm going to zoom in some more and then I'm going to use my tilt tool again and then the fast and easy way is to just Move that down a little bit. And make sure you easy ease your keyframes for your camera. And if it's too fast, move them further apart. If it's too slow, move them closer together. So hopefully this is giving you some ideas. Texture, light, focus, fall off of light and focus. Framing what's in the shot, the order it is and how you see it. Color is another one. Contrast. It's just like graphic design, but you're adding time and space. And like I said, these fast shapes, they help you learn it quicker, and then you could apply whatever you want. It doesn't have to be these geometric shapes. It shouldn't be these geometric shapes. But you get the idea. They're spread out in, in Z space. I 3D enable them by going to my switches, put in the camera. I showed you how to add the camera, how to add the light. And we just learn these concepts faster this way using the simple stuff. And then you apply this with your good artwork. I'm gonna drop down my preview quality a little bit, but you can see how the focus draws your eye to what you want it to be at. So you get that fall off of light and focus as the camera's moving. And just a reminder, all of your assignments can be reworked until the last night of class. That's why I only give out two assignments. So it gives you time once you learn to redo something if you want to bring your grade up. It's all about combining different ideas, playing around, seeing what works, what doesn't work. Blending modes is another one. Particles will really help you in uh, your title sequences. You can create some pretty interesting things with them. Okay, so I'm going to go and add a bright color in the background. Just so we've got some contrast. I'll lock that. Nope. Before I lock, I'm going to duplicate it. And this will be my particles. And I always use Particle World because it's 3D enabled. Oh, almost forgot here. Now, I said this in the lecture. If you watched the lecture on particles. Did I email you? No, you sent me two pages. I was just too lazy to open the second page. I'll do that in a second. When you're doing a custom particle, you want to keep it small, uh, preferably 200 by 200 or 300 by 300. So I put my custom particle in here. Let's turn off the 
transparency so I can see. And of course, you want to make sure the entire custom particle fits inside the reduced background. So we've created that. Here's our particles. Next. Then I add the custom and hide it. And that'll be right here. And I said this before, but texture faded disc is what I normally use because it's round and has soft edges. So you get a nice blurring from custom particle to custom particle instead of hard lines, which was is not the look we want here. Then we need to assign what texture is going to be inside that texture faded disk. You don't want to use scatter because that just moves the particle around inside each of the shapes that's emitting it. Give it a small birth size, larger death size. And then it's just about finding the right physics engine. Okay, fire's looking pretty decent. Birth rate is how many of them are being born. And longevity is how long they're staying on the screen. By changing the gravity, they're moving in a different direction now. Resistance really helps tamp down some of the strength of a physics engine. I use it a lot. So I kind of have the motion I want. Now it's just about dialing in the producer. Decent. So now I can go to extras. Let's try old particle release. So if I do that, and then I go forward one frame. It should help them come out faster. That's doing something pretty interesting there. So now I'm just going to adjust the position of it. Like such. And we could go back, kick it old school, find that tree we had. Put it down here, below the particles, and you'll see where I'm going with this. Go back to our modes. Let's try a luma mat first. See how this goes off the luminescence values. We'll try an alpha mat. Yep, there we go. See that? Now I can say, okay, I'm not seeing the right part of the image. So I'm just going to adjust the position of this a little bit. Get it to where I want. Now we've got something interesting happening with those particles being used as an alpha mat to reveal the image below it. So it's just messed around, playing around. You've seen things like this left and right in credit sequences. Some people get fancy and they have multiple particle systems used as the alpha mat coming in at different times. That's really just, you know, having the particle come in when you want. I'll give you an example of that actually. I'm going to duplicate this. And I'm going to get rid of the alpha mat. I'll turn this both on. Now, the second system I'm going to have come down from the top diagonally. Okay? So, bum, bum, bum. let's move the producer. Move it up. There we go. 
and I'm gonna colorize this. I don't have to, but <clears throat> I'm going to. Uh, da, 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 da. Will this even allow me to? Okay, I don't see that happening, but that's fine. Um, so we got that one. And then what I'll do is I'll just have this that and let's see where the other one's coming in from the first one I'm going to move over to the side just so you can see it more severely and how this is going to fix things and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide this layer down like offset it so it comes in later in the animation like that and remember, alpha mats, it's one layer revealing one layer. Well, I've got more than one layer here. So I just select them both, right click, pre compose, move all attributes. You gotta click that on. So now I can turn on the alpha mat. Now you got different parts of the image coming in at different times, like such. I hope some of this stuff gives you some inspiration and just shows you some of the possibilities and interesting, interesting things you can get in a short amount of time when you think through your idea and then try and work your way on how to get there. The string and the yarn is a great idea because you can have a lot of depth in the scene with the string going across and also, you know, really push the focus of the camera you're pushing through the scene by having a lot of things out of focus or in focus. So it's a good way of adding some depth to it. There's lots of gorgeous things you can do with type and distressing it and pushing it other than, you know, just blurs. So pay close and careful attention to each part of your title animation or credit sequence to make it really sing. And, you know, reach out weekly ideas you have and problems you're coming across so I can help you get the best result possible. And then sometimes you got to rethink things, you know, like depending on the mood you're trying to create. And I just use that bevel that I threw on there. Uh, as a light value for the displacement map. So you'll see the text working its way off once those keyframes come into play. It's just, a, I did a slight vertical displacement. But pay attention to your edges when you're compositing images together. And, you know, just little bits of interest to give life to things, even if it's soft, subtle motion throughout. It'll really keep the viewer engaged. You can use some clips of videos online, like brief ones to put things over, like text or shapes and images. Just try to find royalty-free, rights-free things. Don't try to go using scenes from movies, but you know, B-roll. Again, this isn't anything pretty. I was just experimenting. I would have gotten better results if I put that bevel on inside the image before the text. 
but I could also mess around with the blending mode of that font. Screen gets rid of the black parts and multiply gets rid of the white parts, I believe. But when in doubt, just play around and see what happens. See, now we're getting less distortion of the type because I put the bevel on inside the pre-comp. And that greatly changes the way the font looks. See how the color changes the mood completely and then paying attention to your layer stack and your effect stack as well. Just little tweaks like that can make or break your animation more successful. Now, let's see. I had to pre-compose that and then put the blend mode on the pre-comp and then use a tint to colorize those snowflakes. while still keeping the transparency. Just add that little bit of extra life. And having that at the topmost layer, it'll pass over the text as well to add some interest. How long is the animation, animation supposed to be? I would say about 15 seconds. So if you're doing a title, you know, a very strong 10 seconds with five seconds of it like you know with some subtle motion or if you're doing the title sequence I mean the credit sequence do like two or three scenes that are a couple seconds each but about 15 seconds easily <clears throat> so Carrie what are you trying to rig a character and are your files in Google Drive okay you're trying to rig a dog and are you Okay, so are you using Duik or just trying to do it in After Effects? Duik will definitely help you out along the way. This is my favorite part of the evening audience participation. Okay, all right, so see what you got going on. Did you do a dog rig or a human rig? Duik, as I've said before, is a free plugin. And what I encourage you to do is this. Uh, so you go to your wrench, user interface, switch that to standard. Okay, that's your first one. Then, so you got leg. These little circles. So I'm in the rigging and then structures. These circles and structures means that there's more advanced options to go to. So if I click on that circle, and you hover over, this is the one for dogs. I could hit create. Now I've got a canine leg. And it's a matter of lining up. You already have your joins, which is great. So here's the thigh. I click on the next part. And then I just move 
remove it. I line it up. Click on the next one. So you're going to do that for each one, okay? Now, here's how Duic works. These are structures. Oh, thank you very much, Carrie. You made my evening. All right, so we're in the structures tab. There's three main tabs under rigging. Structures, which is what you'll be doing. Constraints and links. And then controllers. Okay, so we're going to be in the structures. And the way structures work, which leg am I on? A smart man would have selected and found out. Hopefully this is all multiple layers. So let's see something here. There's all the markers, fine. There's the tail, there's the ears, good. I love layers. Okay, here we go, front paw. Here's where we're at, perfect. Let's hide some of this real fast. Okay, so here's what we're looking at. So, here's the way Duick works. You're going to end up, we created a structure with the leg. We clicked on here, the little circle, and you chose dog because you're doing dog. There's other ones like horse, etc. And, you know, you just hover over, it tells you what animals it's good for. If you don't want claws, you can turn off claws. That's your, you can turn off or on what you want. Now, it's best to follow their naming structure, but uh, it's thigh. This is probably the thigh, so we'll put the thigh above that. This is probably the calf, so I'll put that above there. Oh, wait a second, I missed that one. Great. So, let's line that up again. I guess that's like the top of the ankle. No, that isn't the right spot. Okay, so we'll undo that, we'll undo that. And then it's just lining everything up. So that's the thigh, we already established that. So I'm going to guess this, you know, um, that's going to be the next part. Close. We may not need that tiptoe. You might not have enough layers. So let's, let's actually, we'll make this the tiptoe and we'll forget about the claws part. Okay, I'll tie them all together. All right, so <clears throat> here's the way Duick works. So you got your structure and you got your art. What you need to do is parent your art to the structure. So that's going to go there after you've placed your structure. Let's try tiptoe for that. Okay, so these are now parented together. I'm going to go to select structures and I'm going to test this out by going to the middle, links and constraints, auto rig. Let's see if this does it properly and if not, I'll show you another workaround. So we've got a controller here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to my effects controllers panel and Right here, icon. You can move that wherever you want, and that's gonna change where your icon is at. I'm just gonna put it down here. Another thing you can do, you can change the size of it if you're running out of space. And then orientation, you can rotate it. I'm gonna rotate it this way because that's the direction that the foot is moving. You can change the color of it. I'm gonna make it green just so it stands out. Okay, now we can test it. See? Now the leg is moving pretty good. So I'm going to undo. So that works. It made a controller. So with your controller, you've got two options here. P for position. Let's see something. 
Why am I not seeing my stopwatches? Okay, so I'm gonna move the playhead a little bit. And I'll move that there. Yep. So, that's that. Now, let's try Shift R to bring up rotation. Move forward a little bit. And let's see what our rotation does here. Why am I not seeing the numbers? That's a mystery for the ages. Now remember, this position here, that's just to set this off to the side so it's out of your way. Okay, so we're not really using the claws. I was right, we're using the tiptoe because you didn't have any claws on here. And you can see how this is affecting the motion of your animal. So what I did was we can delete the rotation. I put a position on the foot controller. And we moved it up and then we could go move it down like that. And inside here if you want you can start animating these positions if you want with the rotations to make the leg come up a little higher how it impacts the ground stepping down like that so now those are all accessible down here when I hit the U key like such. Does that help you out a little bit? Do it when you're working with structures. Like I said, it is setting up your structures, then parenting the artwork to those structures then you select your structures right let's see right here in the rigging there's a select structures you select the structures and then I did auto rig um, under rig rigging links and constraints so here's rigging links and constraints auto rig all right so that's how that is going to work you go do that for each leg okay and then you'll figure out your parenting sequence. So let's test something out. You're gonna have a billion layers, all right? We've already rigged these structures with that auto rig button. So let me test something out. I'm going to, oops, did not mean to do that. Did not mean to do that a second time in a row. I'm on a roll. Lot of stuff here. Okay, so here was part of the mystery. Expander collapse. So now I can see my toggle switches and modes again. And now I can see my numbers. You had this turned off. Expander collapse. See, now we can see the numbers. And now we can access it. So if that ever happens to any of you, just click down here. Now I can go to my modes. And I'm going to shy enable these structures. Just the structure layers. Because I've already rigged them. And we're going to find out what happens. Now I'm going to hit shy enable. And 
and we'll test out the foot again. I'll move my thing a little bit, go here, and look at that. It's still moving. Once you have your structures rigged, like we just did, you can then shy enable them to save yourself some room. I myself made a character rigging uh, workspace. No problem at all, Carrie. This is what lab time is for. So, you're going to notice every time you go switch around your workspace, I got to go back to the menu here. And I know that my structures are right here. This is for your constraints and links. So, you're going to need to set up all those legs and the tail. Let's find your tail. So I showed you how to do the legs. The tail is right here. There's two of them. And why wouldn't there be? I'm so glad you layered everything, named it. Great job on that. Okay, we're seeing a little bit of goofiness going on there, so just be careful of that. Uh, so let's look at this tail and try and figure out Oh, and you know what? Hmm. I want to test something out. We're going to go really extreme here. This might not work, so don't freak out if something goes awry. I'm going to try and hide your artwork. Now that the artwork is linked, is parented to the structures, and the structures were rigged. I just want to see if we can get back a little bit of space here. I want to see what happens. Now it's shy enable. We'll move our playhead. There we go. It's still working. So you might even be able to hide your artwork. Uh, actually, that makes me think of something else. There's tons of layers here. Let's hide this other stuff. Yep, see? We're working. Good. Now, look at this. I pushed my rig too far. Okay? There's another important thing I want to show you. So, let's see if I can remember where it's at. I think it may be under stretch. Yep. Stretch kept it all together. So I'm going to hit undo. We want stretch enabled. Fine. I used to know where that was, but uh, if I find it, I'll tell you later on. But just watch the how extreme you move that so it doesn't break. So that's that. And then the tail, you could go in and they have a tail thing. The tail should be segmented out, but uh, we might be able to get away with using this. We'll find out. We'll test it out. That's what that time's all about. If this doesn't work, we'll try a different section. So now I'm going to select the next part. I'm just, you know, eyeballing this. Okay, so this tail really should be split up. But uh, let's move these above here. What's going to happen if I... Okay, hold on a moment. Okay. Let's try something fun, because everybody likes to have fun. I can hide 16. Uh, well, too late for that. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you something and we'll go see if this works. I'm going to create bones, okay, and pop.
possibly, if I line these bones up where these segments are, that might make the tail work. So I've got my puppet pin selected. I'm going to click my first time only once. And okay, well, let's see if this works first, all right? So when you're using the puppet pin in Duik, it is crucial you switch the puppet engine to Legacy, okay? So always do that. Then make sure your triangle count is like 300 or so. So now I'm going to click again, and again, and again. So I've got four of them. So that's step one. Always switch the puppet engine to Legacy. Then the second step is you've got to name these. They have to have a name. So I'm going to call this Tail 2. And Tail 3. And tail tip. So I've named them, okay? That's step two. Step one, always switch it to legacy. Step two, you must give them a name. Step three, we go to links and constraints, the middle tab, add bones. So now, I'm going to parent these bones to the structures. Okay, and then I'm going to shy enable those bones, and then I'm going to select my structures and hit auto rig. See if that does something. Okay, so once again, before we test it out, we're going to go to our effects controller, make it a color we can see. Then in position, we're going to move it to where we can access it. Put it over here. And if you need to, you could always orient it however you want. I'm just going to keep it like that. All right, so we can see it. Now we can test it out. And you could also go in and adjust each piece individually. So here's our tail. That did not work. So now let's try doing these right here. Why am I still seeing the structure? Let me hide. let me shy the structures real quick too. Okay, now we select here. There we go. It did work. All right, so now we can move each part of the tail. Give it a little bit of life. And look right here, curve. That's getting all of them at once, okay? That's gonna save you a lot of time. So no, you do not need to split the tail. We use the puppet pin, created bones, and then we parented those bones to the structures, and we selected the structures, and we auto-rigged them. Your curve will do all of them. And if you need to fine tune it, you can go in and individually adjust these as need be. So, what I would do is I would click the stopwatch, move to where we want, and then curve, curve up, there we go, move the playhead, there's your animation, okay? All right, so, you know how to do the legs, you know how to do the tail. The rest of it, you can add a little life to, like a... The head. Let's mess around with the head real fast. Okay, 
Like so, your head will isolate that. You got your head. All right, fine. Now, your ears will probably want to be parented to the head, so that when the head moves, the ears move with the head, and they don't go by the wayside. Okay, now, I'm just messing around. We'll go see what happens. Turn these on. If anyone is interested in learning Duik, I'm going to be, you know, I've got some videos on it. Uh, okay, so you're going to need a spine to connect this to. So probably the head will be with the spine. Let's see if I hit the advanced. I can turn off the hips. Let's see if I can do zero layers. Connect one layer. Let's see what happens. Once the head is this the head, and that's the spine. So you gotta look at what each one is. So that's the head. Maybe this is the top of the head. Let's find that out. We'll put that there. This is the spine. I'm just going theoretically here. Okay, so. We'll do the same thing. Uh, the head, we'll probably need to put pins. These three tips. So, bum, bum, bum. All right. I'm just gonna put some pins there. We'll find out what happens. One, two, three. Uh, big legacy. Name them. One second. Back to there. And I'm just naming them along with the chain going up just so I know what should go to where so I select my pins legacies on go to my links and constraints add bones and then I'm going to parent the bones to the structures we'll see if that does anything okay. so now those are all Parented. I'm going to shy enable those so I've got some space select my structures hit auto rig and let's find out what happens yeah I got the head nodding okay so then you're gonna to want to connect the head to the neck the you know you'll have a spine all the legs will be connected to the spine and you got your tail so uh, hopefully that's enough to get you started on this but remember when you're working with structures if your artwork is broken up into layers parent the individual layers to the proper structure pieces and then select those structures and hit auto rig if you did not split your layers then, uh, one sec, let me turn on the tail. You could use the puppet pins, create bones, name the bones, make sure it's legacy, not advanced for the puppet pin engine. And then, you know, that's what it was. I soloed those. And then you'll be able to move your stuff around. So, why do all these go off? That's weird. So that's a little introduction to structures in Duik. And if you want each lab time, I can go into Duik a little bit deeper. It's, it's very helpful. Um, 
And actually, since I've got a little bit of time, if anybody wants, I can go a little bit deeper into Doic with humans, if you want. I could do that now. Okay, I will. You're here to learn, I'm here to teach. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll start you off with something real basic and then we'll build from there. So you're all familiar with this. Um, <laughs> well, I've got some links I can share with you all. Okay, so this is an example of forward kinematics. After Effects has built in forward kinematics. What that means is I'm going to parent this to there, this to there, and there to there. So. If I rotate the one that they're all parented to, they move together. I can then go in and individually rotate each of these. This is forward kinematics. I've got complete control and I can handle how much arcing my motion does. Doic allows you to also use inverse kinematics. So I'm gonna undo all these rotations. And what should happen is I'm going to, I'm testing this out. This is theoretical here. So you saw structures. We messed around with links and constraints a little bit. Then there's controllers, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add here a position and rotate controller. So this one's just rotation. This is side to side. This is only up and down. This is all four directions. This is all four directions plus position and rotation. So I'm doing this one and it put my controller right there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work my way from, let's pretend this is the hand all the way up to the shoulder. I hold down control, it has to be in this order. From the tip, all the way up to where the motion is going to start, I'm holding down control, and finally, I select that controller. Okay, so I've got all those controlled and linked. Now, instead of hitting auto rig, I'm going to click the circle and choose IK, inverse kinematics. Now we're going to test that out. And see, as I move one, they all move together, like an arm would do. That's inverse kinematics. So I can not only move this up and down, but then I can go and rotate that tip piece as well. Inverse kinematics save you a lot of time with characters. That's how arms and legs move off of inverse kinematics. Here's the character I made for my workshop. And I've got to find the unrigged one. I always work, uh, you know, I label everything as best as possible. Unrigged, here we go. Okay, so if you're doing a person, the first thing I recommend doing right out the gate is, okay, so, First thing you should do, pre-compose the hips, okay? And pre-compose the torso. And pre-compose the head. Inside the head is going to be all your layers. Now, I'm just telling you right off the bat, I got rid of the glasses in my final rig because they were not working with the head rotation. The reason I want you to parent the hips and the torso is because if I add my puppet pinning to my shape layer, I painted myself into a corner, okay? What I mean by that is if I want to have this torso rotate, I won't be able to do that successfully because the puppet pins are on it, okay? That's why I'll put my puppet pins on the pre-comp so that the artwork inside works properly, okay? So, I also pre-compose the hands and the feet as well. And the reason for that is, and this is crucial for anyone messing around with Doic, if you flip something, Doic will go 
nuts. You can't flip or mirror your artwork, okay? I'm gonna hide this hand and we'll go to the right hand. Instead, what you could do is you can pre-compose this. Call it right hand, yeah, sure. Move all attributes. All right, so if instead I take this right hand in my project panel. Oh, I can't find it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save myself some time. Right click, reveal, reveal in project. There it is right there. So if I hit command D in my project panel, because remember, if I duplicate this in the timeline, I'm going to mess up the original. If I duplicate it in the project panel, oops, I wasn't listening to myself. I duplicate it here. Now I can call it left. And then I can throw it right near the right. Long story short, there's my hand. The reason is if I flip this hand inside of the pre-comp, then I'll be fine. So, so here's the right hand, upper arm, and lower arm. Okay, so my hand, I'm going to actually, you know what? Let's do it now. Save ourselves some time and trouble. I want to trim off this pre-comp. And right here is the region of interest. It's like a crop tool. You can adjust it as you want. I'm going to keep it fairly tight to it, but a little bit of space. Say in case the fingers need to flare out, whatever, I've got the room to do that, okay? So I want the full range of motion for that. And then I could just go composition, crop comp to region of interest. So now we've got a much tighter bounding box around the hand and I'm just going to reposition that to where it should be and lastly set the anchor point to where it needs to be which is right at the middle there you can move them from about there okay so yeah that's looking fairly decent there so there's my hand so like I showed you with inverse kinematics I'm going to put a controller on the hand. So I go to my controllers. I want position and rotation. There's my position and rotation. So I'm going to select the hand. First, we're going to go all the way up to where the movement starts. That's the shoulder. And you see I've got everything named left and right. That's the way to go. So I start with the hand and I go lower arm, upper arm, then finally the controller. Then I click the circle because I want to do inverse kinematics. I click inverse kinematics. And now it's working perfectly. Okay. I think I've already showed you how to do the arm creases with, see I got the arm crease with the trim path and all that. But I've got a video on that which I could send you. So you'll do the exact same thing for the legs as I just showed you with that arm. The reason my, if you look at my layer stack, I've got my lower arm over the upper arm, and that's because of that crease that I made. And you see this, this is the IK line, the inverse kinematics line. That's how you know you've rigged it properly if you see that link working. And most importantly, this one is going to save you a ton of headache when you're rigging. Right here in your links and constraints, I've got my controller for the hand selected. I hit zero. That's gonna zero out my position. This is the resting neutral pose. So if I move my arm and I need to get back to that, I just type in zero and it goes back there. So these controllers work off of position. And that means if I just move my playhead and then I grab that controller and I move it, that's going to animate it, okay? If you want the hand to go behind the back, let me just make sure the hand and the lower arm are below the torso in your layer stack. If you want them to go 
over the torso. Make sure those layers are above the torso. And check this out. So let's go here. I'm going to pull up R for rotation. Now remember, this controller can position and rotate. I can rotate the hand without affecting the arm because the arm is working off of inverse kinematics. So the position will only move the position of the arm and the rotation will only affect the rotation of the hand. And that went way too many degrees for my liking. And you can see this line right here showing the rotation. That's wild. That should not be doing that. But uh, so that's an intro to making an IK arm, which would be the same for the legs. Now since I've got a second, I'm going to show you a little bit about connectors. So remember, I am going to hide the neck and I'm going to hide the head. You know what? Let's hide everything but the torso while we're at it. Okay, so I pre-composed the torso. Yeah, the wrist did look broken. I just didn't want to waste time fixing it. Okay, now I'm going to put the bones here. And I'm going to put one right where the belly button is roughly. Remember, first step, always make it legacy. And I'll put it right near the middle. And then basically where the neck would be, like right there. Okay, so first up, make it legacy, then name them. Now this one in the middle, I call shoulders because it's gonna do the rotation for both shoulders. Then I'm gonna put one for each shoulder the arm would meet. Make sure you name them. And actually, this is the right side of the body because it's facing the camera. So I should actually fix that. <clears throat> okay, those are set. So, select all your pins. Legacy's on. Click Add Bones. All these are now on the pre-comp of the torso. Now I'm going to go back to my con my controllers. The belly, I'm going to want position and rotation so that the hips can rotate. So I did that with the pin selected. The chest, I'm only going to do position. The shoulders, plural, I'm going to do position and rotation. And the individual shoulders, I only need position. Now those are all pinned. So I can hide my bones by shy enabling them. Okay. So if I move this middle pin, oops, let me undo that with the bones because I forgot something crucial. I did not parent my bones to the controllers. So belly goes to belly, chest goes to chest, and so on and so forth, shoulders to shoulders. And another helpful tip, if you're doing characters, you should put the character name in there. Like say this is Steve, Steve, shoulder left. Because if you've got more than one character in the scene, you know whose controllers do who. All right, so now that those are parented, now I can hide that. Now I can test that. Oh, nope. Oh, hold up a second. I think I figured out what I did wrong. What if I parent the individual shoulders to the shoulder? Okay, now that's starting to deform. 
and that's starting to work. I think that's what it was. See, now those are turning. Okay, it's because I didn't have the shoulders set up. That's it. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, so, remember, I put down the pins on the pre-comp. Then I named them, made them Legacy. I then parented the bones to the... Well, I set down the bones, then I put the controllers I wanted. You know, position and rotation here, position and rotation there, position for the rest. Then I parented the bones to the controllers. Okay, that's how that worked. Okay, so that's an example of controllers in Doic. So you know a little bit about structures and a little bit about controllers. Now, real fast, I'm going to show you about connectors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my torso and here's my artwork. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a rotation for the torso. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I've got all these contents. I'm going to make two layers. I'm going to hit control D. This one is just going to be the torso shape. It'll be an alpha mat. I'll put that at the top. And that is just going to be the shirt. Just like that, the shape. That's going to be our alpha mat. The layer below that, I'm going to turn, duplicate this one more time. And I'll just call this shirt. Okay, so the bottom layer is just the color of the shirt for the character. The middle layer will be what's on the shirt. And the top layer is just the shape of the shirt as an alpha mat. Here's something interesting. Right our torso. I'm going to drag this out and put it down here. <coughs> so that I've got two stacked timelines. One sec. I'm going to want my controllers in my main character rig. That's why I stacked this artwork like this. To make this rotate, I need to put a null in here. And... I'm gonna right click and hit separate dimensions for X and Y for the null. Now, with Doic using connectors, I'm going to hit the circle here for advanced. That little circle. You're going to need keyframes and then pick a connector. This is side to side or up and down. I'm going to use a joystick. I can do side to side or up and down. I'm going to do the X first and I'm going to put them 10 frames apart. What this is going to be, the middle is the resting neutral, the left will be the left turn of the body or rotation, and the right will be the right rotation of the body. So, let's try and separate these dimensions and see if this works. What if I pick whip to the position? Yep, that worked. So I'm going to choose how far I'm going to turn to the left. I'll go extreme, like a 180, right about there. That's my resting neutral. Now I'm going to see how far I'm going to turn the character to the right. Right about there. And you go saying, well, look at all that stuff off the side. Don't forget we've got a layer mat. A track mat. I mean an alpha mat. So. Boom. There's our rotation. 
for the side to side. Now the up and down, we're going to set three keyframes again, 10 frames apart. And when you're doing up and down, the first one is your up. So let me fix it. Parent that there. So the first one's the up. How far up is it going to go? Let's say about there. And then that's your rest in neutral. And then how far down is it going to go? <coughs> now, if you notice, my zipper broke. That's fine, because don't forget, we've got an alpha mat. So I can make that zipper as long as I want, and the alpha mat is going to keep it inside the shirt. So I go to that layer. make it longer and the alpha mat keeps it inside the shirt so we've got our motion I did a little bit too little there there we go now we're plenty good okay so I've got my keyframes for X and Y okay and you saw how we did a little bit with the controllers and the structures so inside the body here I've got nothing selected but you see I've got this panel selected I'm going to be in my links and constraints well I go to the links and constraints connector but the circle here so that's where we're at and I'm going to click the joystick to create a joystick controller in here and I'll call it body rotation. And then I'm gonna name the one below it. Okay, so I'm gonna explain what this is. This one is the background of the joystick. So I'm gonna hit P and move it. And let me turn off the transparency grid. Okay, so I'm gonna move this out of the way. So it's not bothering anybody. All right. This is our slider connector. That's the joystick inside. And that's parented to the rotation, the uh, CBG, the background for it. And you just move this out of the way so it doesn't interfere with your animating. So I'm going to make sure my uh, slider is selected, okay? And I'm in here. If you're not seeing your properties, you just click the property button. So I've got X. Or Y, because it's joystick, X side to side. I want X for this. So I'm going to select my X keyframes down here because we split the timeline. The last slider you select is where these will be tied to. I click connect to properties. Now I choose Y, select my Y ones just by clicking the word position, connect to properties. So we'll go back up here to our connector. I'm gonna hide that. I got moved off a little bit. There we go. Let's just move it up so you can see what's gonna happen. And we'll test it out. It's already zeroed out. See the body rotating inside? So now we can have body rotation as well as this happening on the outside. That's why I put my puppet pins on the pre-comp so the artwork on the inside I could use to create body rotation. Like such. So that's a little bit of an intro to Dillick. So that's an introduction to connectors, controllers, and structures in Duick. Just remember, structures, you've got to parent the artwork to the structure that you're making. Like for your dog leg, you had the dog artwork, the calf was parented to the calf structure. 
So you paint the artwork. Then the structures, you select the structures and you auto rig them in the links and constraints. You just build upon that and you parent the various rigs together. Controllers we did to create the IK rig for the hands and the arms. That. So the hand would be right here. That created the IK rig. That'd be for the hands and the, uh, the arms and the legs. So that's using the controllers to create the IK rigging for the limbs. And then we made the bones and turned those bones into controllers and then connected all that and put a connector joystick to handle the body rotation. Like such. So, I hope everyone has a great night, and we'll dive deeper into Duick throughout the year. Uh, I've got lots to show you, and, you know, I hope you all have fun with motion design. Uh, Duick is phenomenal for head rotations. Um, I'll go into my final rig here. So, I have in my connector, remember you hit the circle to get to the advanced, I've got a one-way slider to handle the mouth shapes, the visines. You just drag that down and I marked off what each mouth shape is. Like such. And then I set up individual connectors, which we learned in here with the X and the Y. I've got one for the eyebrow. Each one is, each eyebrow is its own connector. So the up and down, I did the Y position. Then the side to side, I used rotation. You can use more than one property with one joystick. So by having my eyebrows separate, I can create facial expressions by raising or lowering them. And I put my anchor point right there at the corner of the eyebrow. My eyes, the motion, you know, I've got that set up for the X and Y, like I showed you for the torso. And the eyelids I've got separate. That's Y up and down for those, the upper and lower. And you'll also notice the I've got a solid and a stroke on one art layer. The eyelid, I don't want that stroke to appear until the eyelid closes a little bit. So I've got complete control over my upper and lower eyelids individually to create a wider range of emotion and motion in my character, like such. So one controller for the upper and lower eyelid for one eye as well as the other eye. It's all about taking your time and doing these things. Yeah, no problem at all, Carrie. I'm glad you found this informative. So I hope everyone has a great weekend. And like I said, in our downtime, we'll just tackle Duick. And uh, hope you all have a great weekend. And that's it. Just enjoy this incredible weather that finally arrived. <laughs>